Well, th thanks very much, Simon. Th this is a uh, this is material that uh, uh, that well, Simon uh, uh, w w might refer to it as, as unpublishable, but that's the difference between disciplines. Because in my discipline, uh, it has all, all been published. So I want to just give acknowledgement to my co-authors for the publications uh, on which um, it, it's based: Damon Santola, Rob Willer, and Koku Ibarra. Uh, and and <coughs> this is. Um, a somewhat uh, different perspective, perhaps, on norms than the usual evolutionary approach, um, because we we often think of norms as having uh, this and religion as having this very important function of maintaining uh, social order, uh, without which uh, uh, our innate human aggressiveness uh, would surface, uh, as as is captured in this uh, uh, famous painting. Uh, but norms sort of protect. Uh, civilization from uh, periodic breakthroughs of that uh, uh, underlying aggressive tendency. Uh, so Kenneth Arrow, uh, norms of social behavior are reactions by society to compensate for market failures. Uh, Hector Knopp, the view that norms are created to prevent negative externalities or to promote positive ones is virtually canonical in the rational choice literature. So the idea is that, that norms are protecting society or they're at least protecting the people who enforce the norms against uh, negative externalities uh, by those who they might be targeting. Uh, but I'm going to look at norms that are difficult to account for from that standpoint. Uh, and I'm calling them normative pathogens because I want to look at how these norms get a foothold uh, and spread. So plenty of examples, I think, that are out there. Um, a foot binding is one. Uh, and, and a picture here to just give you a very graphic sense of just how brutal uh, a, a process that is. Uh, 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 genital mutilation, uh, circumcision, and infibulation uh, in, in parts of uh, sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, breast ironing, necklacing, which is a, a practice of uh, a type of execution uh, often um, uh, inflicted on members of one's own group, not, not the enemy, uh, for people who are suspected of being uh, uh, traitors. Uh, it's a very brutal form of execution. Uh, witch hunts, um, honor killings, uh, famous example happening right now, uh, tr on tr uh, people are on trial in Kingston, Ontario for uh, a father and brother for uh, killing uh, four, uh, three sisters and, and a, a wife. Um, uh, homophobic attacks uh, and ethnic cleansing, uh, lynch mobs, all examples of, of norms that have this pathogenic uh, quality of being destructive, brutal, uh, things that we would not think of as being functional from the standpoint of protecting uh, this thin veneer of civilization against an aggressive human nature. Um, and indeed, it seems that, that adolescents are often especially susceptible uh, to these kinds of, of uh, norms. Uh, bullying is a good example, and particularly not just the bully, but the friends who are cheering the bully on um, uh, for, for fear that if they, if they don't cheer the bully on, they might become the next victim. Um, Adolescents using drugs, cigarettes to gain peer approval, uh, to look cool to their friends. Uh, the use of homophobic language to assert masculinity and to uh, avert uh, accusations of, uh, of being uh, effeminate or gay. Uh, gang violence to prove one's loyalty to the gang by uh, engaging in uh, dangerous but violent behavior. But uh, it's not just adolescents. Uh, adults are also uh, vulnerable to uh, these kinds of norms. And here's one that uh, I think all of us can think of examples. Uh, the incoherent scholar, who we celebrate how brilliant they are uh, uh, in order to not be regarded as, uh, um, as, as an idiot. Um, and I, I, I'm sure that everyone right now has someone in mind. Uh, <laughs> I know I do. Uh, um, democratic, democratic support for the uh, second Iraq war uh, for fear of being uh, labeled as a, a coward or, um, or worse. Um, and uh, Republican opposition to Darwinism uh, for fear of being labeled a liberal. Um, so 
wh why do these norms exist? Are, are they in some way, can, can we rationalize these norms? Can we explain them in terms of, of some benefit that perhaps that uh, accrues to those who, uh, who follow them? Uh, so um, in the case of praising the incoherent scholar, um, you could say, well, yes, you know, you're trying to avoid uh, being accused of being uh, uh, incapable of understanding this, this brilliant uh, person. But, but why, if everybody thinks that they're a fraud, why would anyone uh, accuse a skeptic of being uh, incompetent? Um, and even the example of, of foot binding, okay, it makes sense in that foot binding was important for the maritable, marital eligibility uh, of the girl, uh, but then where did that come from? Why should that be a requirement uh, for marriage? Um, uh, why would a man be dishonored for marrying a woman whose feet were not bound? Um, so the real question here then is that, um, is that uh, look, okay, sure, if, if a norm, a pathogenic norm is enforced, it's rational to comply, but why are they enforced in the first place? That's really the question that I want to address. And uh, a possible answer uh, comes uh, from the, a story by Hans Christian Andersen of the Emperor's New Clothes. Well, what do you think of my new clothes? Do you think the citizens will like them? Without a doubt, anyone who doesn't like your new clothes is obviously a fool. Look at the Emperor's clothes. They're even more So the problem with this explanation is that, um, that okay, sure, uh, the, the, uh, it's easy to understand why uh, everyone is pretending to see, to, to see the clothes, because in the story, if you can't see them, it means you're unfit for office and unworthy. Um, but why are people thinking that in the first place? And you can see the problem here is that that, that this equilibrium is fragile. It collapses. It takes only a single child um, who's naive about the norm uh, to break the spell, and, and it collapses. And yet these pathogenic norms have existed uh, for, for hundreds, in some cases thousands of years. They're, they're in fact often uh, highly robust and, and highly non-fragile. So how then do we explain the persistence of these norms? Um, and we, we uh, uh, we, we don't see that in the Anderson story, where the equilibrium is, is fragile. Um, so um, one of the uh, reasons why people may enforce these norms is as, as, as a signal. Um, and the idea here is that, that although the compliance with the norm is rational given that it is enforced, rational compliance is irrational. And the reason that rational compliance is irrational is that it's not enough to comply with the norm. You have to comply for the right reason. And you have to do it for the right reason. If you're just doing it because we're, we're going to sanction you if you don't, that doesn't show that you really complied. That just shows that you responded to sanctions. You have to show that, you, that the compliance was voluntary. And how do you do that? Um, and in fact, one of the problems here is that in some ways, especially when you observe among, among adolescents, that it's not the kid that doesn't conform who's the lowest on the, uh, the rung, lowest rung of the ladder. It's, the, it's the, what they call the posers. And that's the term that adolescents have for kids who are pretending to comply to be popular and to gain acceptance. And they're the lowest of all. They're the worst. So the worst thing you can be is a poser, and you lose out twice. You've, you've now done something that's self-destructive in order to gain popularity, but you didn't even get the popularity because people suspected that you were doing it to gain popularity. So you've got to prove that it's genuine. And, and so then you get the paradox that, that irrational enforcement 
is rational. Uh, that in, in a sense that, that it's a nice signal, it's a way to signal that your compliance was genuine, that you didn't do it just to get approval. And uh, in the paper we call this the illusion of sincerity uh, from this quote by uh, Jean Giraudot, the secret of success is sincerity. If you can fake that, you've got it made. And so the idea here, we see also in uh, Arthur Miller uh, from The Crucible, uh, the best proof of the sincerity of your confession was your naming others whom you had seen in the devil's company. So in the witch trials, if you were accused of being a witch, you were not necessarily punished because, you, in fact, you become a hero if you then turn in the people who infected you, if, if it were, as it were, uh, with, uh, with witchery. So it's, it's um, and so this enforcement is a way of, of showing your, your true uh, allegiance to the norm. Now, the question that, there, there are really two, two puzzles that I want to address. Uh, uh, one is, uh, what makes a population susceptible? So here we have two, for example, two populations. Um, <clears throat> this network has a long mean geodesic. This one is a short mean geodesic, sometimes called a small world network, uh, created by a, a, a few random ties. So in which of these networks would we expect a normative pathogen to be more effect, to be, to be better able to diffuse? I, any suggestion? What do you mean diffuse? Just spread throughout the group. Sure. This one. But in fact, what, we, what we're going to show is that it's this one. That in fact, the, sh the small world network, the connectivity, actually protects sure. the graph from the, from the pathogenic norm. Okay, start in the small thing. Well, well, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to unpack this in, in just a moment, why it happens. So this is sort of one puzzle, that, that although this network might be very effective for the spread of information or the spread of disease, it's, it's less effective for the spread of normative pathogens. The normative pathogens do better in these networks that are more parochial, that are not as well connected in a global sense. And another puzzle. Both, both, both the speed and the number of individuals who will be reached, both, yep. Uh, a second puzzle, the puzzle of minority advantage. Um, so imagine that there's some true believers, right, who just really do believe in the norm, and there's some on both sides, some favor the norm and some oppose. Um, and imagine that one side really outnumbers the other. So let's say that the opponents greatly outnumber the supporters, the supporters have the advantage. That, that the fact that it's sort of the big lie result in the sense that, that the, 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 the side that is the minority has an advantage over the true believers in the population who agree with them. So there are the two puzzles that, that I want to unpack. The puzzle of why is the small world not an effective st structure for the diffusion of these pathogens and why do the true believers in the minority have the advantage over those in the majority? So to explore these ideas, we have a very simple model of false enforcement of a norm. That is, enforcing a norm that you know not to be true, that you don't believe in, that you wish would go away. You're not doing it because you believe in it. You're doing it because there's pressure. And it's a signal of your sincerity. Uh, in the face of that pressure. So uh, we have a belief. Uh, the belief can be either B or minus B. It's binary. There's no, it's not a continuum. And then an action which can be truthful uh, or it can be a falsification where you're acting against what you privately know to be true. Um, we have deviance which is the proportion of the people that you observe uh, who are expressing a view uh, that's the opposite of what you hold. We have a cost of enforcing the norm. And there's some pressure to falsely comply with the norm and to enforce, which is simply the proportion of those whom you observe who are enforcing the opposite of what you believe. So there is this, the proportion who are enforcing the opposite of what you think. And there's um, a pressure to, um, 
to reveal what you think, which is just the proportion who enforce what you do believe. So just the flip side. And there's a strength of conviction, uh, which is, you can think of it as a, a, a payoff, or you can think of it as something expressive and emotional. Um, it's, it's what holds you to your belief and makes you want to act in a way consistent with your belief. So it could be that you could think of it as the costliness of falsification, or you could just think of it as the psychic displeasure of having to do something that you know not to be true, that you know isn't true. Um, and so here's the key part of the model. It's a threshold model, uh, not so different from what Simon was expressing or showing us earlier today. You have a threshold that's given by the strength of your conviction. Um, and um, and you, um, you express the opposite of your belief if the pressure to falsify, the number of people enforcing falsification, exceeds that threshold. Um, and, um, and otherwise, you, you express your true belief. And then you enforce your, that false belief if that social pressure exceeds a second threshold, which is higher than the first, given that enforcement entails an additional cost um, over and above compliance. And we can set that at, at some level. And then finally, you enforce your true belief. You get people, you pressure people to do what you actually believe in as the norm, um, depending on, on the level of deviance. So given that there's a cost, if, if everybody is in compliance, you don't bother to spend the uh, effort to sanction. But if, if the level of compliance drops below, uh, as it drops, you become increasingly uh, uh, likely to, uh, to pressure people uh, to <coughs> hold to the norm. So the key implications of the model that true enforcement is self-limiting in the sense that the more the people comply, the less effort you need to expend to try to encourage people to, um, uh, to comply through sanctioning. Whereas false enforcement is self-limiting, the more who enforce, the greater the pressure to also enforce in order to demonstrate the sincerity of your compliance. So to summarize then, we have true believers who comply not because of pressure, but because they actually believe in the norm. And they enforce because they want others to comply. And we set their conviction at, at, at the maximum of, of one. And then there are disbelievers who don't believe in the norm. Uh, they comply with the norm only if social pressure is great enough to overcome their, their sense of conviction against the norm. Uh, and they enforce to show that that compliance was voluntary. The true believers have strength of conviction. The disbelievers have strength in numbers. They're the overwhelming majority of the population uh, don't believe in the norm, but their convictions are not as strong. And so the question is, under what conditions then can this minority of true believers in, invade and infect a population of disbelievers? under these assumptions about why people can conform and why they enforce. And uh, to, to be able to observe this diffusion, we'll use a, a spatial network, although we can also run this on non-spatial networks. Uh, this is a Voronoi diagram, which just is a, has the advantage over a grid that, uh, that you can have. Uh, it's an irregular network. The degree can vary. And the way it works is that each cell is surrounded by a set of neighbors just as it would be on a, on a um, spatial topography, a, a lattice. So this is a, uh, an irregular lattice, or Voronoi diagram. Um, and um, the color code works like this. So um, these, a gray cell, cell means that you deviate from the norm. Um, and, uh, and a black means that you deviate and enforce. So it's just the stronger version of gray. And then uh, a pink with this crosshatching means that you are a, a true believer, but you're complying only if you're pink crosshatched. And then when pink goes to red, you're a true believer, you comply and enforce. And the crosshatching means that you're, you, tr you truly believe it. You're not doing it because of pressure. And then finally, uh, pink and red. Uh, pink is you're falsely complying when it's just a solid pink. 
And then if it's a solid red, you're falsely complying and enforcing. So it's, again, the same principle that red is the stronger version of pink, black is the stronger version of gray. Black and gray, you're deviating. Uh, red and pink, you're complying. And a cross-hatching means that it's, your behavior is your, your true belief. You're not, you're not falsifying. Um, so there the, the cross-hatches are the true believers. And um, so one of the interesting things to just start out with is that uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, uh, in a fully connected network, in a population where everyone is connected to everyone else, in other words, we just set the radius so that every other cell here is a network of any given cell, um, that in that type of network, or lack thereof, that, and with the true believers, even what doesn't matter now, what they're struck, doesn't matter whether they're clustered or dispersed, um, they cannot convert the network because they're too small a minority. And so this is an equilibrium in which uh, no one changes their compliance behavior or their enforcement behavior. Uh, the true believers are enforcing because people aren't complying, uh, but they're not converting people because there are too few of them. Um, so that's an equilibrium. Um, and it's also, um, it's also an equilibrium when everyone enforces and, and everyone complies. But the question is, can you get from this equilibrium where no one is enforcing and complying other than a few true believers to an equilibrium where everyone or where most are enforcing and complying? You only see the behaviors. So you don't know their inner belief. You only know their behavior. So here we're going to observe uh, what happens when we embed this population in a, in a spatial network where the radius is only one. So each cell is connected only to those in its immediate vicinity, those that are adjacent to it spatially. Uh, so we've gone to an opposite extreme, if you will. And, um, and so we're going to now look to see if the true believers, of, a, of a, a very small proportion of true believers, can infect this population with a norm that, that everybody else does not believe in privately. So we'll run the model. And as you can see, it is spreading. Notice how the disbelievers fight against it. They're, the, it's black along the perimeter, uh, along the front lines, if you will, of the diffusion but they're overwhelmed. And as you can see, they don't get completely wiped out because as long as there are some, some disbelievers with strong convictions who are somewhat clustered by chance, uh, they will stick with their beliefs and they will continue to, to deviate from the norm uh, and indeed to enforce because they, the people around them are not doing what they want them to do. So you do have these pockets of resistance that never disappear. Um, but obviously, the, the, the supporters of the norm, the true believers, uh, won out and, and were able to. What's your dynamic on that? I mean, what's the dynamic? How do you move from one? Uh, how does one cell change? Uh, it's just a simple threshold model. So where, the threshold model that you talked about earlier. Mm -hmm. okay. So if, you're, if the level of enforcement among your neighbors okay. exceeds <laughs> a threshold given by your convictions, you comply. And then that threshold plus another little margin for enforcement you also enforce. Is your, is it, uh, a lot of your neighbors or just a neighbor? It's the proportion of your neighbors. Of your neighbors. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah, from zero to one. Yes. So the, 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 your little core of true believers down there don't spread. Uh, that's correct. That's exactly right. But we're about to have that happen. So you, we haven't done that one yet. We're just, that's the next slide. So that's right. So these true believers, uh, these, by, by the way, you notice the true believers have stopped enforcing. Why? Because people are complying. Well, why spend the effort? So they're not even enforcing anymore because they don't need to. They've won. So now, just to follow up on Pete's uh, question, so it's, it's entirely plausible to imagine that if you fake it, you know, you, you start out, you're a kid, and you're smoking cigarettes to appear cool. You hate the cigarette, but you're not going to show that. And you're even going to tease the kids who don't smoke. And the same thing for drinking. Uh, there's studies that show that college students uh, are, are, are privately 
uh, uneasy about excessive alcohol intoxication uh, in their fraternities, but then they still go out on Saturday night and not only drink, but they enforce drinking by making it clear that they think that drinking kids are cool. So it's, it's plausible to imagine that after you do this for a while, you actually begin to like cigarettes. And maybe you actually begin to like drinking, or you begin to like whatever the norm is. You actually change your beliefs so that you now conform to the norm. So we're just going to run this same uh, model again, only just change one thing, which is that after a certain number of, of uh, repetitions, uh, or a certain number of, t of time periods, uh, if you have been enforcing a norm against your private belief, you will change your belief to be consistent with your enforcement behavior. Now, now we should, so now all these people are, gonna, are going to be inf changing their belief to actually believe in this stuff. And let's see what happens when we run it this way. So again, you see it spreading. You see the resistance, the black along the edge. And, and it spread just as quickly as it did before, maybe even a little faster. But now look, it collapses. It falls apart. And this is, uh, this is illustrating this principle that although, you see, we actually have true believers on both sides. We have, we have blacks with strong convictions, just like we have reds. But the reds win out, not the blacks. What's the disadvantage? Is it that the blacks don't have quite as strong a conviction as the reds? No. It's not because the blacks don't have the conviction. The problem the blacks have is that people agree with them. The reds have the advantage that people don't agree with them. And what is that advantage? The advantage is that it creates this insecurity where you need to enforce in order to demonstrate that your compliance is genuine when in fact it is not. And so th what this model is showing is how that dynamic, that, need, that signal, or that need to signal can cause this uh, uh, asymmetry between the people who believe in the norm truly and those who, who don't. Um, and then I want to uh, unpack the structural story, which is the most important part of the story in the paper, I think, which is why is it that a small world network in which information, disease could spread more effectively, why don't the pathogens spread just as well in such a network. Um, so um, we, can, we can create a small world network by replacing some ties with, with random ties, holding the density of the network constant. And when we do this, by adding just a small number of random ties, a network can have the same connectivity or very close to the same connectivity as a, as a random graph and yet still be highly clustered. And that's really the, the definition of a small world network. And so the question is, will this randomization process, this creation of, of random ties that, that weave the network together, weave the population together, will that promote the spread of these normative pathogens? And what we find is that, that no. On the contrary, there's a phase transition at about uh, 0.01. This is the probability, this is the fraction of random ties probability any given tie would be broken and replaced with a, a random tie. And what we find is that there's a phase transition that occurs here where suddenly the social fabric will no longer conduct the spread of these pathogens. And, and indeed above, above 0.1 probability of, of randomization, uh, they don't spread at all. And, and, and it, but it slows down the spread, but it also reduces the number that can be reached by the diffusion, and, and, it, and, and, uh, and critically so. So why does this happen? So imagine that we have, on a, on a, we'll just illustrate it with a lattice, a regular lattice. So imagine that A is in a neighborhood that's red, and that neighborhood is infected with the, the normative pathogen. And B is the center of another, of, of, this is B's neighborhood. And and B is not infected. And then there are these three purple cells that are infected because they're part of A, but they're also neighbors of B. And the question is, will B become infected? And the answer is yes, 
as long as B's threshold uh, is, is less than 3 eighths, B becomes infected because the proportion of infected neighbors, uh, proportion, proportion of neighbors who are infected is, is 3 out of 8. But now let's randomize the network. And we've replaced some of the, the, uh, the edges with random ties. And by chance, it's come out that this, this tie was broken, this was broken, and now, and now A now has neighbors scattered about the network. So if it only took one infected neighbor, like it's a disease, it's the flu, this is going to speed things up because this is going to send the flu way over here and open up a new a new uh, front line of infection and another one over here and another one over here. But if you need three neighbors to be infected, it makes it harder because now B can only become infected if B's, B has to have a threshold that's much lower. It has to be less than, than one eighth. And that threshold of three eighths from before, uh, B would not be infected. So that's the mechanism by which the spread of these um, contagions benefits from uh, from this clustering, not from the connectivity. So we tested the model in the lab. Um, we did an experiment. I don't know if you know the ash line experiment with the unequal lines, and uh, Solomon Ash ran this to see if people could be convinced to say the wrong line was the unequal one. We replaced it. We did, the, um, we did the, a wine experiment. We replaced the lines with wines. And, um, and we wanted to see if we could get people to not only give the wrong answer, but to enforce it. So uh, we had three wines, and they were actually identical. We told people they were different. And we put a little bit of vinegar in one. <laughs> and, um, and we had four confederates who go first, who rated the wines uh, that, that the vinegar wine was better than one of the untainted and that the two most dissimilar wines are actually identical. And, uh, and then the subject gave uh, his or her judgment fifth. Then the sixth gives the truth. And about half the participants, in fact, gave the wrong answer. But that's not what we were interested in, because well, we already knew from Ash that that'll happen. We wanted to find out what will happen if they're now asked to rate the abilities of the other wine testers, and they knew this was going to happen beforehand. They knew this all along. Yes? Uh, did they, were they rewarded for being correct? They were told that they're, um, that they're uh, and they, in one condition they were so told they, they that by they were told that they would be rated, that they would be given evaluations by others. They were also told in one condition that all of their ratings, both of the wines and the wine tasters, were going to be published. So there was a social approval payoff, no money involved. And so here's what we found. So we then had the subjects rate their fellow wine tasters in public or in private. And here's what we found. We found that in private, the conformists rewarded the truthful deviant. So they, their enforceable behavior was the opposite of their compliance behavior. But what we found is that in public, when they had to do it in public, they flipped. And they now punished the truthful deviant. So in private, they said, OK, this person said what I knew to be true. And of course, I'm going to say that's, a better, that's, a good, that's the best wine taster. But in public, they, they said they rated them low. They flipped over. So then just to make sure that this really will hold for things other than wines, we ran it again. This time we used the Sokol texts. Do you know those? Alan Sokol? <laughs> Somebody knows the Alan Sokol texts. <laughs> They're hysterical. You should go read them sometime. It was, he, he, Alan Sokol is a physicist who got so tired of deconstructionist gobbledygook that he published a paper that was gobbledygook. And, got, and he submitted it and it got it published in one of those journals. It was a big scandal. So we took one of those texts, one of the Sokol texts, which is just gobbledygook, and we had them, it was now, that was the tainted wine. And they, they now, the, the subjects had to say it was brilliant. And then they were, got, we, we wanted to see if we could get them to agree. And sure enough, we could get them to agree. And also, again, in private, they, they did not punish. In public, they did. They, pub, they punished the person who said it's gobbledygook. So there was a 
a sensible Texas that they were judging the, this against, I take it? Uh, in this version, no, they, uh, they were just given uh, a nonsense text. Um, then we did an additional test. So uh, there's a th famous theory in sociology, the strength of weak ties from Mark Granovetter. Uh, it's one of, I think it's the most cited paper in the social sciences. And he says, uh, whatever is to be diffused can reach a larger number of people and traverse a greater social distance when passed through weak ties rather than strong. And the key here is whatever is to be diffused. So we want to find out, does this apply to things that have a high threshold of adoption? And so the idea is that, these, that our strong ties to our close friends and family, these tend to be highly clustered. Our, good, our really good friends probably know each other. Um, and, uh, but our weak ties are likely to be to people who might not know our other friends, especially our other weak ties. And, and our argument is that, yes, this idea that things pass more effectively through the weak ties, that, that's the paradox. Things spread more effectively through the weak ties because they're no, it's, it's non-redundant, right? It's non-redundant. It's going to people who would not otherwise have access to that same information. So you can hear about a job, for instance, better through your weak ties because you will have already heard about it from people with your strong ties. So, uh, that applies to the spread of information to disease, but does it apply to peer influence of the kind that we're interested with norms? So we want to know how, we wanted to test this idea that, that for the spread of, of, of norms, for the spread of behavior change, where you, have, you need social reinforcement, it's not the connectivity, it's not the weak ties that matter, it is the clustering, you need the clustering. So, we test, so if you can ima imagine um, three cases. So A has one friend who is adopted or uh, uh, who's, who's um, yeah, let's say has adopted something. And B, B has um, three friends who've adopted, but they, they're not friends with each other. C has three friends and they are friends with each other. So there are triangles among those friends, right? So the theory is that C will be the most likely to adopt because of the clustering among the friends. So we tested this with data for an entire social network of an entire country. We got all of the telephone logs from the UK, from British Telecom, uh, for August of 2005. And, um, and, we, and we generated a social network uh, we got rid of the robocalls and we got rid of the wrong numbers and all that sort of thing. So we, we, these are actually, um, for the most part, individuals, not, not companies and not uh, housing units. It's mostly individuals that are talking to each other. Um, and those are the network characteristics for anyone who's, who's interested, just in, uh, for curiosity. Because this is, I think, the only full social network of a country, or the most complete social network of a country that anybody's... Um, been able to get the data for. Um, there's another study that used uh, uh, Microsoft instant messaging uh, uh, to, to do something kind of similar. And what we did is we tracked the spread of a voicemail product that was, that was virally marketed. It was, there was no advertising for this product uh, over this telephone network. And, um, and, here's, and what we wanted to find out is we wanted to find out um, uh, is your likelihood of adopting this technology, this voicemail product, does it increase with the number of your friends who've adopted, and does it increase with the number of triangles among those friends, which is picking up the clustering in your friendship? And indeed, that's what we find. So just looking first at the red lines, you can see that as, as the number of triangles goes up, your probability of adoption goes up uh, no matter how many of your friends have adopted. So this is not just picking up that, you know, this person has more friends who've adopted, because th th for this, this is for all of those who had, had four adopting neighbors. And this is all those who've ha had five. So we're holding that constant. We're just counting the triangles. And as you can see, the probability is going up. Now, one possibility is that the triangles are just a proxy for tie strength. So you have stronger ties when there's triangles and therefore more influence. So we, we also controlled for uh, the strength of the time measured as the, the volume of, of calls, the time 
uh, on, the, on the phone and the number, the frequency and the duration. And as you can see, that's, that really didn't have much of an effect when we netted that out. So even net of tie strength measured as call volume, uh, we still see this very strong relationship between the number of triangles and the probability of adopting the technology, which again provides some confirming evidence about the importance of clustering for diffusion as opposed to connectivity for diffusion, which was the original puzzle that I posed a few moments ago. Um, how much, so I've got a couple of minutes left. I'm going to talk a little bit about a, another study um, that is um, a little bit different from this one. It's, we're going from here from pathogens to polarization. Um, and we're going to, instead of having one belief, have many beliefs at once, demographic attributes that you cannot change, other attributes like opinions and norms that you, you can alter your behavior. Uh, and we're going to have ties that have valence. Positive ties means you have influence. A negative tie means you want to differentiate from that person because they're a pariah group or, as I mentioned this morning, a parent in some cases. Um, so um, what we're showing here are, uh, since we've got, we've got um, seven attributes here, six continuous and one demographic attribute, the demographic attribute is whether you're a red or a blue, uh, chosen deliberately uh, as a way of indicating it for politics, for electoral purposes. The size of the circle is how many people are in that combination or profile, if you will. And because we can't show a, a seven-dimensional object, we're going to look at the first the two eigenvectors of the matrix over time. And as we run it, what you're going to see happen is that indeed the population is polarizing. And now at the end, all the blues agree with each other on everything. All the reds agree with each other on everything, and they disagree completely with the blues. And so now all of those attributes have come to be correlated. And if these two groups are fighting with each other, sociologists will be convinced that this demographic attribute must really have had some causal effect on their behavior, making them want to fight. Otherwise, why would they go to all that trouble? But in fact, what this is showing is that it was completely arbitrary. It's a kind of frozen accident in the language that, that Simon was using um, earlier today. Um, so you get these arbitrary correlations, and you know, here are a few of them from the general social survey, uh, that, that you can predict people's environmental views from their musical preferences, uh, their views of inequality, uh, from uh, their importance of hanging out with friends, uh, their belief in the supernatural from their beliefs about animal rights. And I'll just give you a Those quick are far less than one. This is on families by $1,900 a year. Oh, what are so they? This didn't. What do you think of Howard Dean's plans to raise taxes on families by $1,900 a year? What do I think? Well, I think Howard Dean should take his tax hiking, government expanding, latte drinking, sushi eating, Volvo driving, New York Times reading. Bob Pearcy, Hollywood loving left wing freak show back in Vermont, where it belongs. Got it? <laughs> so, the, the, the thing that's interesting here, why should it be possible to predict somebody's views on taxes from whether they drink lattes or have body piercing? Um, I mean, and, and what, why should lattes be connected to Volvo driving? I mean, is it because Volvos have better cup holders? Um, <laughs> And, and what our model shows is that things are going to get correlated in this model that are meaningless. They're just going, it's going to happen. And therefore, you should just expect to find uh, unrelated things becoming correlated. And that does not mean that there isn't a reason for the correlation. It just means that the fact of correlation should not lead you to assume there must be a reason. That hence, the, the, the relationship between demographics, what ethnic group you're in, or, uh, and, and your beliefs could be just as arbitrary as your musical preferences and your beliefs. It's just an ar and, and the problem here is that when we, we can run this model over and over and over again and see that each time different things become correlated. But we only get to watch 
the evolution of opinion and norms one time, the one time that we're observing empirically. And so it, ha it acquires an intellectability about it that invites explanation. But our, our model suggests that if we could just run history over and over again, the next time we run it, it's the conservatives who are drinking the lattes and the liberals are driving the Ram, Dodge Ram pickups with the guns on the back window. <laughs> So this, I'm going to leave you with the question about where, where do beliefs come from? And, and surveys assume that observations are IID. They're independent and identically distributed. And the idea is it's as if each, each survey respondent lives alone on an island. And it's their own individual experiences and interests that shape their beliefs independently of what's happening everywhere else. That's crazy. In fact, what what happens is that, that people are influenced by their neighbors. Observations are not independent. And this, this process leads to the clustering of beliefs um, and even to, to conflict uh, and violence between people who disagree. So they can really take this stuff very seriously, even though it's arbitrary. Um, and, and, and so what this is suggesting is that, that using surveys and multivariate linear models to study opinion is a really uh, inviting uh, spurious results. They're not necessarily spurious. You could be finding exactly the right answer, but be careful because the survey is assuming independence and people are not. Beliefs do not, we do not live on islands and our beliefs are not just internally generated. They're coming from our network neighbors and depending on the network topology and the ways in which beliefs and conformity are enforced, some crazy things can happen. And I'll end on that note. <laughs> Pete. So your general survey, social survey questions had correlations of uh, Rs of uh, uh, 0.12 and so on. So that's far from, uh, from one, whereas your model uh, predicts that those things should be one. Uh, well, I, I did one version of the model. So actually, depending on the network structure, uh, so what you saw in that one version of the model was actually a fully connected network. If we run that on a network that's more realistic, if you will, that is, that has lots of clustering, uh, then you will, in fact, get something that looks somewhat more pluralistic, where uh, you will have clusters that will form that are homogenous and another cluster will form that is homogenous. Different, uh, but not, uh, different on some dimensions, but not on others, right? So uh, I did a simple one just to kind of make a point, but you can get others. Also, I, I actually didn't pick the biggest numbers from the GSS. So we have some that are up there in the point threes and point fours. I picked some more that I didn't want people to start inventing an explanation and say, well, well now wait a minute. Those two things could be connected logically. So um, I, I, in fact, I'm pretty sure they're just as arbitrary as the ones I picked. So I just, I sort of picked more by what's crazy than by what had a big correlation. But some of the correlations are pretty big, uh, uh, up in the point threes. And in social life, that's actually a pretty big correlation, even though the percent variance explained is, you know, less than, than uh, I mean, it's pretty small. It's, you know, yeah, it's like uh, point, point one, point oh one. So. Um, um, yeah, so it, it, different network topologies, we can get different patterns. And of course, what's interesting is that when we run this thing and we get these different little pockets, the pockets are homogenous, but when you do a, a, a survey over that population that's random, it looks like there's heterogeneity because the different pockets are different from each other. And if you think about the 2000 election, anybody remember who won that election? A guy named Albert Gore, remember the margin of victory? It was less than 1%. Was that a close election? Was that a close election? Yes. No. 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 The average mar uh, margin of victory was 15 points. Was it, close? was it close in Orange County? Was it close in Santa Monica? Was it close in Ithaca? No, it was a landslide in Ithaca. It was a landslide in Cortland, which is right next to Ithaca. The two canceled each other out perfectly. Yeah. And Orange County and Santa Monica canceled each other out. So what's, what are they putting in the water in Orange County that's different from the water in Santa Monica? Uh, so the point is, is that the overall aggregate that you get is that it's a close election. But in fact, that's belying the clustering 
uh, that's going on at, at the local level uh, as a consequence of, of social influence from peers. I mean, what's going on in Orange County, I think it's uh, heavily social influence. I don't think you can explain it by something about Orange County that's so different from Santa Monica. Or uh, college towns, you know, you can probably explain it with selection. Um, and, and to some extent, selection is important because once the political identity of a community is formed, it shapes who wants to move there. Then once they get there, the rest of the differences evaporate over time. Herb. Um, people often ask me, what's wrong with the economist rational activism? And the only thing I say is that it assumes you have a subjective prior and you make your choices subject to your prior. And in fact, humans are network minds with distributed cognition. And when we have a difficult decision, it's always made by, av by averaging over and polling all of the networks that you're involved with and making use of all of the distributed cognition that's available to you. When you do that, I think you get a really good model, but it's not an individualist model. It's a mm -hmm. model like the ones yeah. that you've sort of developed. Exactly. So yes. Solve this by digging network, uh, well, facial and network and sort of spatial geography. Have you tested these results of your uh, homogenation? Yeah, in fact, there are quantitative, that's right, there are quantitative methods to pull out autocorrelation. Uh, temporal and spatial autocorrelation are a lot easier to pull out because we can measure those very easily. Network autocorrelation is tougher because we have to know data on, on your network neighbors, which we often don't have. Why? Because we think we're supposed to ram randomly sample. And we don't like snowball samples where you would actually get that. So what this is suggesting is you actually do need to do network samples. They can't just be ego networks, right? You can't just be, I'm going to randomly sample people and ask you about your network. We actually have to go talk to your neighbors. And then once we do that, we can pull out, net we can measure network autocorrelation, um, which I think is more insidious than, than temporal and spatial autocorrelation for the simple reason that it's harder to deal with. And also because I think that, that, um, that, that sociometricians in particular um, uh, d just don't think about it. They think that they don't, they just don't worry about IID. They think, well, it must be IID because it's a random sample. Well, yeah, but the population has to be IID from which you sampled. And, and the dirty little secret in sociology is that we just are going to pretend to not notice that or talk about it. Um, and so, yeah. And I think also economists are protected because you're, they're mostly studying phenomena that are not easily influenced. Whereas sociologists and political scientists, our dependent variables are easy for people to change, easily influenced. And so I think it's a much bigger problem for, for political science and sociology. Anybody studying an opinion is, is taking a big chance when you use a survey and a, a multivariate linear model and think, I've taken care of spuriousness because I have all these controls and not worried about network effects. Well, Michael, that, think of the financial crisis. The reason it wasn't predicted was that you don't have IID errors. The errors are correlated. You get distributions like Cauchy with fat tails. And you get excursions away from equilibrium that are yeah. huge. And again, yeah. it's because you have network minds. That's right. You re everybody reads the newspaper every day, yep. and you build up this kind of psychic movement in one yep. direction or another that uh, can lead to, yep. you know, very. I mean, what we're, what, I, what we're doing in my lab now is to collect our data from the web. Because when we, when we, get, we, we take data from the web, we get the networks, and we can measure the stuff. It's very hard using survey data. To, to do network analysis, but I think the web is going to transform social science because for the first time, we can have the end that you get in a survey with the detailed observation of human behavior interaction that you get in experiments and in field studies. Yes? Uh, would, like, so if you're making a survey, you're calling somebody, and they're probably generally answering and like, not among their friends. They're probably in a, in a room alone by themselves. So would they tend to answer more truthfully just like they did in your experiment? the answer more truthfully. Maybe. I mean, that's what your experiment showed as well, right? Um, our, our experiment showed that their enforcement behavior, we didn't change their compliance behavior by public and versus private, but their enforcement behavior, they were more truthful in private where, they, where their behavior would not be observed by the others in the group. So yes, yeah, so I think anonymity 
if people are worried about what their friends will think, take their friends away and maybe they'll tell you what they really think. People who study pluralistic ignorance, which is the tendency to, to think that other people think differently than you do, when in fact they don't, they've applied this to the study of things like college drinking. And, and indeed that's what they find, is that when you take people out of their fraternity and talk to them privately, they, ex they have a very different, they express very different views about drinking than they do with their friends. Yes? The one thing I was going to avoid, I heard, heard this morning also, this idea that you've you got this ideological fostering, mm -hmm. but it could be different, it could be, ra it could be random. I mean, admittedly, there's no, there's no logical reason why lucky drinkers should be environmentalists and should be yeah. sympathetic to gay marriage or whatever. Right. However, that's a pattern yeah. that you see across an awful lot of different societies. You know, people in the, you know, not just in the United States, in Europe and other places, people who actually want less government intervention in sexuality, want more government intervention in the economy. Right. There must be some deep structure there. There must be something, something that's needed. Or it could just be that we're very well networked now. Uh, and and the, you know lattes are spreading. Um, so what we found, in fact, we we tested this. So what we did, it's hard to do with the GSS, but we took regions and we said, well, regions maybe there's not as strong social influence between regions, just as you're suggesting between countries. And we did find significant regional variation in the correlation, sometimes in the sign of the correlations. Um, so I would suggest that if we take international survey data, I mean, this, you know, I, we'll probably do this in the lab, because there are qu international surveys that are w very well aligned. I predict that we will find a number of strong correlations in, in different countries with opposite signs. The theory says we should, and I think we will. Yes? Good question. Um, so yeah, I mean, one of the stories here is that social mobility, geographic mobility, the internet, the telephone, these things do protect societies from the spread of, of, of pathogens, normative pathogens, because you're, you get better information. You don't just know your, what, what's true in your local, you know the population distribution. So it should help. Um, I would test it pretty gingerly first. Uh, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Thank you very much.